afternoon good evening from wherever you're watching this you know this is the studio q show live right now and mandy we have a show today and we got a super special guest and i know you guys are going to be climbing in here we got people climbing on youtube right now get ready bring your questions we have uh dr sheldon solomon phd um the author of or one of the authors of the worm at the core the, uh, our contemporary expert on these ideas of death, anxiety, terror management theory, all this stuff. If you have, if you don't know Dr. Solomon Sheldon, go on YouTube, watch his videos, listen to his lectures. They are worth every second of your time. And I know a lot of you have already. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, we can, we'll watch, uh, the comments. We're going to give, we're going to turn the uh, floor over to Sheldon for a little while and let him, um, give us, and you guys, if you've been with me the last four or five weeks, you know this. We spent a lot of time on Becker's The Denial of Death, that book, The Worm at the Core, Sheldon's book and his cohorts, and uh, just talking about death denial, death anxiety, and terror management, and how all this plays out. And what I wanted to do in this last show, and I'm so grateful for him coming on, is bring in this idea of death anxiety, terror management theory, for artists. Uh, specifically for photographers, and I would even narrow it down and bring it right down to these an ancient processes or these old processes, right? Especially the wet collodion process that we work in and how it was used. We just talked last week or the week before, I can't remember now, um, about uh, uh, post-mortem photography, about that the, the essence of what they were doing with photography to, to keep their people alive and to, you know, symbolically, you know, we talked about all this, right? We talked about all this stuff. I'm going to let the expert, I, I probably thought, I hope Sheldon doesn't watch the shows because I've probably done a terrible job explaining this, but he can come on now and clarify everything that we need to know about it. So let me do this. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I see you. Maureen, Thilo, Will, Mark, Matt, Mauricio, thank you for joining us. Um, we, uh, and Sheldon, we have everyone from all over the world. We have Brazil and Japan and, you know, everywhere. Uh, 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 Mr. Ismail, is, you're in Indonesia, no? Uh, no, in Malaysia. Malaysia, sorry. Uh, Malaysia. Yeah, next door. <laughs> <laughs> so, th this audience is wide. I know we're Americans. Uh, Jeffrey's Canadian. He, he's, he's, a, he's a good friend and always in here. Peter, everybody. So. Come on in, get your questions ready. I'm gonna turn the floor over to, to Sheldon and let him talk about it. We got a good group in here now from YouTube. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over and, and let Sheldon talk about his ex, his uh, passion and preoccupation about this. So with that, thank you, Sheldon. And I appreciate you coming on the show. Well, uh, my pleasure, Quinn. And uh, thank you everybody um, that's listening. I, I feel, um, at a bit of a disadvantage, but in the best possible way, because when Quinn contacted me and asked me to weigh in, um, it was quite clear to me that he was already intimately acquainted with these ideas. And uh, very much uh, just from our conversation five minutes before we're all together live, uh, kind of on the same proverbial page with regard to the implications of these notions uh, for art and for the artists that produce artwork. And so um, I know you've heard this before, but let's do the five minute classic comic overview uh, of Ernest Becker and of what we call terror management theory. And then we can dive directly in, into the art world. Um, basically my introduction to these ideas was started with a single sentence that I saw in an essay by a guy named Alexander Smith, a Scottish dude in the 1860s, where he just said, it is our knowledge that we have to die that makes us human. And I remember seeing that and it was like a knee in the psychological groin because I was like, geez, I don't like that idea. But my gut told me that he was right. Uh, if for no other reason than I'd been disinclined to die since I was a kid and realized it was gonna happen to me. But then I stumble onto Ernest Becker 
Uh, and uh, he, in his book, The Birth and Death of Meaning, he says, I want to figure out why people do what they do when they do it. And I was like, me too, dude. And then in the birth and death, of, uh, or in the denial of death, rather, in the first paragraph, he just says, it is our awareness of death and our disinclination to accept the reality of the human condition that underlies most of what people do. And uh, in Becker's view, um, we're not much different than other creatures in that we're biologically predisposed to want to keep living. On the other hand, uh, we've got this big forebrain that gives us the capacity to think abstractly and symbolically to the point where we can imagine something that doesn't exist and make it real. And that's like awesome. Uh, and part of uh, this configuration of cognitive capacities uh, that enables us to make the unreal real, as Otto Rank put it, is that we're so smart that we know that we're here. And Becker, following Kierkegaard, just said, look, it's awesome to be self-conscious, but it's also dreadful. It's tremendous to be alive and to know it. And I hope that every one of us understands how, how excellent that is. And yet, if you're smart enough to know that you're here, uh, you also realize that like all living things, your life is of finite duration. You can die at any time and that you're an embodied animal. As I jokingly say in all of these uh, talks, you're a breathing piece of defecating meat that's no more significant or enduring than a lizard or a potato. And Becker's claim that we agree with is that if that's all you thought about, I'm gonna die, I can walk outside and get hit by a comet, uh, um, a cold cut with an attitude, that you wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning. Uh, and the reason that uh, we can function with a degree of psychological equanimity in Becker's view uh, is because of culture, that what we do quite unconsciously as human beings is to embrace the humanly constructed set of cultural beliefs uh, that is common to our community. And, and what that does is to give us a sense that life has meaning and, and that we have value. And Becker's point is that uh, all cultures offer an account of the origin of the universe, a prescription for how we ought behave while we're here, and some hope uh, of immortality, either literal or, or symbolic for people who behave in accord uh, with culturally constructed dictates. And, and in a proverbial nutshell, what Becker is saying is that we manage the existential terror engendered by the uniquely human awareness of death uh, by perceiving ourselves uh, as people of value uh, in a world of meaning. Uh, and that whether we're aware of it or not, and mostly we're not, we're highly motivated at all times to maintain a sense uh, of our beliefs being true and our value within the context of those beliefs uh, being quite real. All right, so uh, what about art? And um, the point that Ernest Becker makes, and perhaps more importantly, Otto Rank, uh, from whom Becker gets a lot of these ideas, is that art has always been central to human affairs. It has always been one of the most substantial and enduring ways of managing uh, our death anxiety, but managing it in a way uh, that uh, fosters personal development uh, and social progress uh, at the same time uh, that it serves uh, as a concrete manifestation of uh, concrete activity on the part of the artist uh, that, that it is um, impelled in part by what Ronk uh, called an immortalizing tendency. Uh, and so uh, one of Ernest Becker's points based on Ronk is that uh, we're not only afraid of death, we're also afraid of life and that our fear of life makes us want to fit in and be the same as everybody else. Our fear of death 
makes us want to stick out. And one of the ways that we can stick out is by creating something uh, that is novel and unique. And of course, that's one of the things that uh, we're doing as artists. And so Ralph Waldo Emerson, for example, he says, I think, or he said rather, I think we fly to beauty as an asylum from the terrors of finite nature. I, I couldn't have said it better. Um, uh, who else is there? I think it's George Bernard Shaw who said, without art, the crudeness of reality uh, would make the world uh, unbearable. Nietzsche, uh, without music, uh, life uh, would be a mistake. Uh, and so we know that art originated five minutes after humanity arose and that it most likely uh, predated um, discursive language. Uh, and is it is from art and with art that humans constructed rituals, and rituals in turn are myths in action. And so basically what we have is a dialectical process where over time, human beings through the construction of art make it possible to at the same time construct these epic narratives uh, that we generally call myths. I'm putting that uh, in quotes because the word myth uh, gets a bad rap these days. And, and as Rollo May points out in his great book, uh, The Cry uh, for Myth, um, uh, what myths are, uh, are essentially, uh, they are epic tales uh, that give us a sense of meaning and value uh, and uh, uh, art originated um, in, the, in the context uh, of a mythologicalizing, narratizing creature. Uh, and it is from art and through art uh, that human beings are able to make their way through life uh, with a modicum of psychological equanimity. I will shut up in a moment, but let me just add one other point. And that is, I uh, like how Henry Miller, one of my favorite authors of the last century, put it uh, when he said, art is a stepping stone to reality. It is not only a means of personal expression and a way of providing us uh, with a form of symbolic immortality, it's also just a fact that when we step back, it's the artists who always have ideas first. And a couple of centuries later, the philosophers catch up to it. And then maybe the psychologists, a few millennium uh, thereafter. And so art is of quintessential importance. And we need to remember that because in America right now, we see it as a hobby, and that the first thing that we do uh, whenever we run short of money in public education is to get rid of art and music, thus contributing to lobotomizing our children and to rendering them uh, alienated non-entities at a time in the history of the world where we need art more than ever. All right, hopefully that's enough to get us going to begin with, Quinn. Wow, very well said. That was awesome. That's perfect. Um, I love I love that idea of, of how art has always been this way of dealing with life in general, but 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 to come around full circle and now and that's why I was compelled to to reach out and to to read everything and to look at this and, and to and then it took me months to even say, hey, do you guys want to talk about on this show as artists, as photographers specifically, you want to talk about this idea of death anxiety. Here's, here's this guy that did this book in the, in the early 70s and he died right after. And, and now here's these three guys that come along later in the late 70s, early 80s, and they put all these ideas into place. And what are these ideas? It was a bridge to, to, to get people interested in this. But there is a group now that, that I hope this will catch on. And I would love to see artists um, consciously apply these 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 ideas to their own work and see see how they uh, see what changes or just see what happens as they move through 
um, making art intentionally and knowing where, like you said, this kind of, what did Becker call him, a buffer, immortality projects, things like that. And, and Ron did too, obviously, as you just quoted. So I, I've got a question right off the bat, and I want to get your feedback on this. Um, I'm going to just share this screen here, and I, I'm going to have you, we'll read this quote. Um, uh, where is that? Uh, um, paintings, uh, entire, no, window. Um, sorry. Not that one. I, I don't know why I can't pull this up. Um, preview. Uh, huh, I can't pull this up for some reason. Let me see if I can find it another way. Uh, I'll do this one. Let's do showing this one. Let's share this and I'll just show you at the top of the page here. Um, this is, uh, Susan Sontag. She, she wrote the book on photography. I think it was released. It was a, comp a compilation of essays in 1977. So this was post Becker. But wow, look at this quote. This is just like to me, it's amazing. Um, the quote said that top one there. She says, uh, "All photographs are memento mori, memento mori, right? All photographs are that. To take a photograph is to participate in another person's or thing's mortality." Wow. Vulnerability, mutability, precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it. All photographs testify to time's relentless melt. I think, you know, I mean, that's as close as I've seen to Becker, Becker's theories and, and your work and your cohort's work to, as it applies to photography. This, I've, I've known about this quote for wow. 30 years, right? And so at the end of the day, I've always been interested to hear, and I know you're an experimental social psychologist, but more importantly, you're, you're, you're dealing with death, terror management and death anxiety, and death denial. I know this is putting you on the spot because we didn't rehearse any of this, but what is your initial or visceral reaction to that quote from Sontag? Well, my reaction is the same as yours, Quinn, which is that if we had to, if we were working at a Chinese restaurant and we needed to take all of Becker's ideas and put them on a fortune cookie to capture it, this would work extraordinarily well. And I've never seen this. I admire her work uh, quite a bit. Um, and wow, this, yeah. this, yeah. Uh, yeah, honestly, it, it does, it really wraps that up. And then she has another one here. Um, that's a partial, yeah. uh, where she talks about, and, and this is the other one I wanted to get, just, just let you read and see, this is really, um, amazing. She talks about, uh, using the camera as a gun and doing a, a soft, uh, where is it? A soft murder, uh, killing someone, which is really bizarre. Um, where is it? I can find it here. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, where is it? Ermin, does anybody have slice? Uh, no, that's a, maybe it's right below that. I think it was right up. The, I think it was up top. Is to violate yeah, there, them. There, there, there it is. Here it is. To photograph people is to violate them by seeing them as they never see themselves, by having knowledge of them that they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. Very interesting there. Just yeah. as a camera is a sublimation, right? Or a, you know, yeah. like gases passing to liquids, vice versa, of the gun. To photograph someone is a subliminal murder, a soft murder, appropriate to a sad, frightened time. Yeah. That's quite powerful as well. Yes. Uh, no, I, I don't want to get in a pissing match because the I, I agree with that idea. And yet I would respectfully submit that it it cuts both ways in that in the first quote um that's the uh, the opposite in other words i believe that she is really eloquently and profoundly um if i knew what i was talking about a little more i i would say that this is a perfect articulation of my understanding of Emmanuel Levinas, the French philosopher yeah. who I, I've just becoming familiar with. And Levinas's point is that, uh, you know, at our best, 
we are relational entities who behave in deference to the appeal of others. And that's what I see her saying in the quote up top is that uh, to photograph somebody it is at its best to uh, is to participate in their lives and that there are ways that you can uh, take a picture of someone that doesn't reduce them to an object subordinate to your own conceptual categories. And yet that's what we typically do. Uh, and, and Levinas's point is that, uh, you know, that those are two kinds of relationships. Actually, it goes back to Aristotle. We either treat people like people or we treat them like objects. Uh, and so I think philosophy as, or, or rather photography as in life, um, you, you can be a, a, a humanizing and humane photographer who in the process of your endeavors is in a position to depict someone as they actually are such that uh, seeing themselves as you have portrayed them is uh, uplifting uh, and revelatory. So, so there, I hate looking at myself. Uh, and and yet every once in a while, and this is and by the way, it's all it's been the few times that professional photographers have managed to take pictures of me when I didn't know they were doing it, and they capture me in a moment where I say to myself, if I was really fucking like that, that would be great. Uh, and maybe I was for a nanosecond, and I wish I can hold that. And, and yet. Uh, other times, I don't know how a photographer uh, is able to reduce me to a culturally constructed meat puppet by, you know, taking my picture in front of the Velvet Jesus at the gas station. And I'm like, no, wow, you've, you've made me an American. Uh, thank you and fuck you. Uh, so I, I, I see it both ways. And I think that, um, that she's really got it. And I think that's why, or, you know, uh, artists at their best uh, are, you know, rel revelatory and inspirational and uh, at their worst, um, their Amazon Prime um, with a digital piece of equipment. Well said, <laughs> so, so absolutely correct. I, I just wanna jump on and, and piggyback onto what you're just talking about there. There's, you know, and I understand you're not a photographer and you, you, you know, you, you, you photography is ubiquitous. We know how it works and functions. I have a general idea. But within the art community, if you will, and, I, and I'm going to try to speak for everyone here, but there's this power play and you know this. There's this power play that this photographer has this camera. He or she is in control, usually a he. And, and I think some talk here is talking about this power control and objectifying people, turning them, as she, she says, turning them into a possession. That's um, right. And, and, and we know this argument where these, you know, and I hate to stereotype here, but this middle-aged white guy that has yep. a little bit of disposable income and he buys a $10,000 camera system and he gets a $300 20-year-old model to come in and strip down. Yep. I think this is what we're talking about here. And this is a big thing. And my question to that to you is this, by acting out on that, by, by having, and let's just stereotype this, this middle-aged white guy with disposable income buys $10,000 worth of digital camera equipment, hires a $300 model off of Model Mayhem, makes art, right? Is this some, what is this? What's going on here? Is this some kind of self-esteem issue? Is it what do you, can can you talk about objectifying through uh, photography like that? And in fact, a little bit of what Sontag says here in her second quote yeah. is objectification. Yeah, and so to be silly, perhaps, but not what I would submit is that whether we like it or not, any human affectation um, is susceptible to being monetized, commodified and reduced to a caricature of a stereotype uh, such that what at its best might be life enhancing uh, becomes the, 
antithetical to life itself. And so, um, you know, for example, uh, it's probably two years ago at this point, I think I was in Italy right around now. And I do remember uh, vividly uh, how agitated I was watching the middle-aged white guys. And honestly, they often were uh, like setting up their tripods uh, with the lenses that looked like they could reach to outer space, you know, to get that, you know, magic moment that they didn't even seem all that interested in looking at as much as posting on their outlets because it doesn't count till somebody else sees it. Yeah. And, the, and so in that sense, um, uh, we run the risk, all of us, uh, uh, as artists or just human beings, uh, to fall prey uh, uh, to the fact that any human pursuit can be reduced to a mindless effort to deny death, while at the same time, it might also at its best uh, be a way to express ourselves in a very pro-social fashion where everybody profits as a result. So I love Otto Rock's point when he talks about art and artists and he's like, wow, and this is Suzanne Langer, a philosopher I like a lot also of yesteryear. They're like, look, if you're an artist, uh, regardless of the medium that you work in, let's stick with photography for the moment. I hope that every artist has had an experience where you produce something and then you step back and you're not being arrogant or narcissistic. You step back and you're like, wow, that's like awesome. I didn't even know I had it in me. Have you ever had one of those where you transcend yourself and then you actually learn about yourself in the process? So that I like Suzanne Langer uh, going off Freud saying yeah. that, uh, you know what? A great artist need not know what is on her or his mind. And until you make the work, uh, which Otto Rank said, it is what did he call it? He called it the objectification of subjectivity, the yeah. concretization of the abstract. Uh, that basically art is a, a tangible projection uh, of what's happening uh, underneath. Okay, that's awesome. But great artists almost always have a, a, a social dimension where they sincerely hope that their art will be appreciated by other humans not just to make them rich and famous, but to be literally enriched by virtue of contact with the work of art. And so uh, I see it, uh, you know, both ways, but certainly uh, at their best, uh, I think artists are the penultimate uh, avatars of what humanity could be if there's to be any of us in the next couple of thousands of years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well said. I, I I work personally, and I can only speak for myself. I work from the position of, <clears throat> for me, art with a capital A. Art for me has to have intention. It has to have context. Um, it has to have. It, it, I always say, when you create art, you're creating from your heart and your head a question, a, a, a concern, a love, a hate, something driving you. And what I've never understood until I ran into Becker and, and your and, and your cohorts um, work is, and I never understood what drove me, but it was in there, like you're saying. And I've always said, um, I, when I photograph, my main thing is portraiture work of marginalized people, marginalized communities, and ideas of marginalization. So I've always had my camera. I try to pushed my camera the last 40 years away from these ideas to try to do something else because I didn't fully understand what I was doing. And it always went back, usually portraits of marginalized communities. And then <clears throat> I went through graduate school. They, they gave me some verbiage and ideas and some things that I could connect some dots to and 
from my genetic heritage to, to all kinds of stuff that I could kind of write about and talk about. But I always used to say, I always used to give this example and say as in America anyway, not so much in Europe and other parts of the world, but in America, I have to contact, contextualize this. When you pull up to the street light in a, in a city in America and you've got a man or a woman standing there with a cardboard sign saying anything that helps, God bless, and you're just like, wow, I gotta roll my window. Why isn't this light changing? You know, I photograph those people. I try to esteem them, humanize them, and then look at the person, let the person that's so afraid of them confront them in the image. And I always used to say I was interested in that tension between this suburbanite not wanting to see the, the, the person with the street sign begging for money and that tension. I always used to call that just tension. Then I ran into Becker's work and your work. And then I, I, could, I could actually put some data to that and understand to some point why this is happening and this death anxiety and, 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 and this difference and this, this confrontation and, and how we act out on it or not or what we do. So that's kind of where my work has come from. And, and I totally agree with you. I think a lot of my self-esteem comes from engaging with other people and artists on ideas of the work and what the, the work is about and why it's important and why it needs to be made and why I'm preoccupied with it and why I can't stop doing it, right? My self-esteem basically is what we're dealing with here. But I really do feel like, like you said, artists could be kind of the avatar, like you said, of the kind of the ideal thing. It doesn't, it doesn't alleviate any, the, the, the death problem, but I, I'm sure we could redirect some of that, that anxiety about otherness to a better place. And I think for me, that's what I think art, at least personally, is what I try to do. Um, I, I don't leave it out there for people to interpret necessarily. I give context, I give intention, I give these ideas of difference and otherness and, and all this and let people engage in their own ways with that, right? So I have a gallery show and they walk up to a, an amputee's image or something else that, that, that they wouldn't be comfortable with otherwise and they can get intimate with that. And then it's a catalyst to have a conversation about why we're so anxious about people who are different, why we're so like turned off and like put out by people who are so different from us. And, and, and when I ran into Becker and then, then your work, it was like, wow, I, I've got it. I, I'm preoccupied. I've got to tell people about this, about this, these ideas. And that's why we're sitting here today. So totally agree with you there. Um, what about, um, I, I know this is kind of jumping off here a little bit, but for the last year and a half, we've all um, talked about uh, this idea of uh, uh, COVID. Um, and, and I, for one, can't quite reconcile the, uh, the idea of everyone all around the world, and that's just not in America now. Now we're, we're global, right, with COVID. Why, or maybe the better question is, if we're reminded of our death every day, putting a mask on, getting an injection, listening to the COVID rates, whatever it is, are people acting out on that? And, and what is the percentage of people that act out on that anxiety in that context? I would think the world would be gone, gone mad by now, right? From death anxiety, reminded every single day, nonstop, turn on a radio, turn on a TV, go online. It's constantly in your head. Can you address that a little bit about the COVID pandemic and, and the common person being reminded of death every day? What is that doing or is it doing anything? Well, well, Quinn, I'll be silly like I often am. If I could address that adequately, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut on a beach with my Nobel Prize. But <laughs> yeah. um, the fact of the matter is, um, I think the world is going mad from this um, in substantial ways. And so after September 11th, 2001, um, we were asked to write a book. Uh, we, Jeff Greenberg, Tom Pazinski, and I, um, uh, about terrorism, uh, it, you know, and they, the American Psychological Association said, hey, take three months, tell us why it happened, what's going to happen next, and how we can keep this from happening again. And of course, we didn't know anything about terrorism, but we tried to learn. And our point was, well, the events of September 11th 
are going to be like a giant death reminder, like in our experiments. And so we predicted that the same thing was going to happen in life that we saw in the lab, that people were going to become uh, more um, ethnocentric. They're going to hate people who are different. All right, sure enough, within two days after 9-11, there were hate crimes. Uh, we said uh, after 9-11, uh, people were going to tranquilize themselves uh, with the trivial. Uh, and sure enough, after 9-11, they rented more movies, they gambled more, they watched television, they drank more, they used more drugs. We said that pre-existing levels of psychological disorders would go up. That's what happened. Uh, we said that people were going to be more likely to vote for charismatic uh, right-wing political leaders who said that God has chosen me to rid the world of evil. And, and sure enough, George W. Bush uh, was reelected. And we did lots of experiments at the time showing that Americans didn't like Bush unless you reminded them of death first. All right, fast forward to the pandemic. Well, we said the same thing. Uh, would happen. Uh, Americans are generally racist. We became more racist. Uh, a lot of Americans are fascists and we became more fascist. Orange Hitler would never have been elected in the first place uh, without death anxiety. And he came very close uh, to stealing this election. He's still working on it um, this time around. Uh, and so uh, I think that generally, uh, in the pandemic, uh, in response to pervasive but mostly subtle reminders of death, that most people have just become more deeply entrenched in their pre-existing belief systems, but not everybody. And this is where I think there's grounds for hope. All right now, first of all, not everybody in America uh, is a future fascist. I don't mind annoying people just almost half of them. There's some people in America that I think the pandemic gave them or forced them to step back and to see things more clearly. So when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, this pains me to say this, but if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, that might have bothered people for two days before they got back to Taco Tuesday and Amazon Prime. They would have been, yeah, that was bad. Uh, now let me click to something else. But I think just maybe enough white people uh, were, uh, were, were because they were sitting there and because they were detached from their, quote, normal lives, I think this was an inflection point in a good way. Uh, and, uh, and that some people that would define themselves as, let's say, liberal or progressive, but not liberal or progressive enough to get off their asses and do something. Martin Luther King in the letter from Birmingham jail said, you know what? The most dangerous people are white moderates because they are right minded. But whenever something bad happens, they're like, let's have a 5K race and a T-shirt and a mug and then we'll uh, take a nap and nothing good will happen. I, I think the good thing that happened from this pandemic is the realization uh, that there are massive structural problems in the U.S. and in capital based uh, economies in general. Uh, that have to be addressed if we're to ever make any progress at humanizing uh, the world around us. So I think that was a good thing. And, and then I, I think that the pandemic uh, was sufficient for some people, uh, you know, borrowing a term from Plato, you know, back in the cave. He said the average person is stumbling around in the dark, kind of sleeping while awake. And then Freud he described neurosis uh, as dreaming while awake. And then Bob Marley, wake up and live. Uh, I'd like to think that the pandemic uh, was, uh, to use a crude metaphor, was a wake up call for some of us lucky enough to have enough to eat and a place to stay. 
All right, so now I don't want to be cavalierly indifferent, but the large chunk of humanity whose lives were directly threatened by the pandemic, if it were my world, uh, then priority number one is let's get some food and a tsunami of vaccine to the people who need it most. And we need to do that, uh, obviously. But, but for those of us comfortable enough to not be directly threatened by this. I, I like my former students calling me saying, you know what, maybe I don't want to be a hedge fund manager, uh, delirious at the prospect that the mere passage of time will make me more wealthy. You can't fucking eat money. And what good is money when uh, the climate is no longer fit for human habitation? So there may be a lot of folks who have uh, existential crises in the best sense of the word uh, that might not have uh, happened otherwise. And um, I, a lot of my students, and they're, they're awesome humans, but here they are on the cusp of middle age saying, I, yeah, I don't need to be a corporate lawyer. You know, I, I was, a, I also dabbled in ceramics or uh, I like cooking. Uh, maybe I'm going to twiddle my life. I, sure, I need to eat. Uh, and unfortunately, whether we like it or not, you need money to eat. Uh, but there's different ways to procure sustenance. And I'd like to think that we're on the cusp uh, of some kind of metamorphosis where people are more concerned as we used to be about what we do than we are what we have. Wow. But yeah, very, I, I, you know, that's the first time I've ever heard anything like that about the pandemic. So that very interesting. I want to go back to your comment about um, who said that the moderate whites are, or Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, of course. Uh, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I used it in my earlier work which I thought was very profound. Ian Kershaw. Oh, yeah. Ian Kershaw said, the road to Auschwitz was built with hate, but paved with indifference or made usable with indifference. And yes. so very profound. Um, I've, I've always said indifference is one of the biggest problems of human nature, right? Like you said, we can have all these beliefs and we're progressive and we want everybody to, you know, you know, egalitarianism, everything's fair and equal, but we do nothing about it. And But very good points on the pandemic. I, I have never thought of it that way. And I do see some of those things. And I do hear some of those things that you're talking about, people changing their attitude about money and wealth and fame, which is the antithesis of, of death, anxiety, and death denial, terror management, right? They're going in kind of another direction. Um, but uh, and very interesting. Uh, Chopper says, I thought COVID-19 would have spotlighted the vulnerability of our elderly care, but sadly, this has been overlooked. Interesting there. Yeah. yeah good point, Chopper. And again, at the risk of sounding glib, um, old people remind us that we're going to die. Yeah. And our culture, which is the ultimate death denying one, um, if anything, uh, this will make us even more impervious. Yeah. To caring for the elderly. I wish it were otherwise, uh, but I, I, I think the cliche that you can assess the merits of a culture by looking at how children and old folks are treated is poignantly and profoundly true. Um, what uh, And maybe, maybe we'll hopefully even baby steps um, that this will goad at least some of us yeah. into um, just re-imaging uh, our, our society. Um, it's, and again, it's hard not to sound uh, glib here. Uh, so I'll recommend a book. A guy named Michael Sandel, a Harvard philosopher, just wrote a book called The Tyranny of Merit. Uh, and what he points out is that you know, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, our society is not really structured to maximize well-being so much as to maximize profit. And those are two very different things. Uh, and 
I like how Max Weber, the German sociologist, put it in his book about uh, the Protestant work ethic, where, and, uh, 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 you know, and at the risk of quoting from Karl Marx, but Karl Marx, he, he thought capitalism was great a, a, as an interim phase. That, that he said, look, uh, th there's nothing wrong uh, with having the technological capacity for everybody to thrive. And capitalism is pretty good at that, but there comes a point after which it, it is problematic. It's exploitative and alienating. And so Max Weber, uh, he's in the, about a hundred years ago, he's like, look, at first industrialization uh, was a bonus and every, it raised all of the boats. But then he says we became imprisoned in our own gilded cage. And I like that metaphor uh, because we used to want to have money uh, so that we can buy things that enrich our lives. But now we're just mindlessly in pursuit of an, an insatiable amount of money and stuff. And we've become imprisoned in our own gilded cage. And then he said, I don't think it's going to change until the last lump of coal has been burned. Mm. I was like, wow, dude, uh, yeah. wrong fuel, but right analysis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And so, uh, you know, this is, I'm not the only one that's raised this question, you know, up in Canada, the Naomi, is it Naomi Klein? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, all of these folks are, are saying, um, yeah, if we want to render uh, the earth um, uninhabitable for humans, if we want to make uh, humankind max maximally miserable, uh, if we want to amplify existing ethnic tensions, then let's just keep going in a, a free market capital-based system. Uh, and Hannah Arendt, after World War II, yeah. in the book about the origin of totalitarianism, um, she was way ahead of our time because she just said uh, that racism uh, and environmental destruction uh, and uh, capital in search of capital, that those are inextricably connected. Uh, and uh, because I, I, you know, I can't remember anything, including what I said five minutes ago, I don't remember the actual argument, which is quite sophisticated, uh, but they're all uh, literally, according to Becker, death denying affectations. Uh, and so here we are, you know, talking about uh, the future of humankind. And by the way, none of this is to suggest uh, that uh, market economies uh, are intrinsically bad. Let's not confuse and conflate our natural tendency to exchange. Uh, with this predatory death denying effort to be in sole possession uh, of all of the chips. That's really different. Uh, and uh, there are uh, any number of social arrangements uh, where uh, you have markets, but the ones that are regulated fairly and operate somewhat smoothly and they do much better than controlled economies. So I don't think it's an accident that uh, if we just look at all of the things that are associated with high quality of life rather than gross domestic product, yeah. that the places that seem to do best uh, are mixed economies. They're market economies embedded uh, in a social welfare framework where you start with the assumption that we are a social species where individuals have a right to live. See, only in America do we deny that assumption. And that's why we are sociopathic narcissists because we subscribe uh, to uh, the, the view of John Locke, uh, who in the second treatise on government said, in nature, uh, there are no societies. There's just individuals uh, who pursue their right to accumulate property. 
Now, if you accept that assumption, then the best way of life is capitalism, uh, just selfish people uh, grabbing as much as they can. Uh, but Locke's assumption is wrong. We never were autonomous individuals. We've always been uh, uber social, hyper cooperative. Uh, and uh, so uh, I find it ironic that only in America do we venerate a, a way of life uh, that is fundamentally destructive to the individual as well as to the broader social order. That, yeah, excellent. It helped me out here, Sheldon. I think it was Margaret Mead. She was asked, when was the first time we knew humans, blah, blah, this or that? You can help me out. But she, basically, she said, the first time I saw a femur or they, they saw a femur that was mended, that they said they took care That's of correct. other human beings. Just like you said, animals, you get a broken leg, you're done, yeah. right? You're and done. they just this week uh, unearthed uh, an 80,000-year-old a remnant of a burial of a three-year-old, su suggesting that uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, grief as an expression of love is quintessentially human. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, and I think the artists will uh, hope help um, uh, just uh, help a lot of us remember or recognize, recognize, as it were, um, the, the, the way that we are. Uh, and that, that to put that another way, and, and at the risk of sounding, you know, like Mary Poppins or Walt Disney, you know, at our best, um, we as human beings are, are, we're not only social, you know, we're uber social, and yes. we're not only cooperative, we're hyper cooperative, at least with regard to the way that we interact with people in our tribe. Yeah, true. And so the, the trick, the way I see it, it, is not to encourage people to be even more ruthlessly and insanely self-absorbed on the hamster wheel of life, where if Jeff Bezos has this many billions, then I need and plus one more billions. That's just the recipe uh, uh, for psychological despair and economic and environmental catastrophe. Uh, there's just not only, uh, only malignant tumors and compound interest do you want things to just increase in a spiraling fashion. Uh, you know, I just think uh, we are quite capable of doing better than that but for a lot of people, myself included, that just seems like the way things are. Uh, you know, so if you're in America and you say we can do better, uh, we can cooperate with each other, uh, you're denounced as a socialist, but also being unrealistic. But that's by no means unrealistic. It's just how do we create the conditions that bring out that aspect of our humanity uh, which is already there to begin with, but that we do a fine job uh, educationally and economically uh, of lobotomizing fairly early in life. Yeah, and wasn't it, it, it correct me if I'm wrong here, My, I'm not, I think it was in Das Kapital, Marx's book. Um, he said capitalism, uh, to your point, he said in within capitalism, um, one thing leads to another. Capitalism will ultimately end in fascism. That's correct. Socialism ultimately ends it in communism. But within, and, and correct me, I'm not an expert on this. I just, I read things, right? Um, he said, I believe it was in Das Kapital, he said, capitalism, you'll either be, be exploited or exploit. Correct. The, okay, good. So to your point, that's exactly what um, we're seeing and everything you just laid out there. And so as an, as an artist, whatever your medium is or whatever your, you know, you're a sculptor, a painter, a musician, a writer, whatever you are, a photographer um, uh, or an artist that uses one of those mediums, <clears throat> how do we go about or what would your suggestions be of how an artist uh, from the psychological perspective of all this, how, how does an artist pr uh, approach their work or talk about their work? Or how would there be any other way to frame 
statements or ideas about the work or without going into, you know, I mean, I know people get tired of being around me because I talk about Becker and the worm at the core and TMT and all this stuff all the time. And, and they all they want to do is see pretty pictures or something uplifting or something interesting. And how do, how do we form as artists the verbiage or the, the, the words that support and inform our work to the viewer, the layperson? How in this context, how would we go about that? Do you, do you have anything on that at all? No, but as real, <laughs> can I read what you said in your chat? Please. Because I. I uh, yes. I, I would love to because I defer to the artists here. And while I was blubbering earlier uh, uh, on our internal chat, uh, yes, is uh, uh, from Ezreal. For my own practice, sometimes reflected as well in some of my peers, art offers a viable arena for the articulation of imagining worlds. Brilliant. Moreover, as a safe house surrounded by advanced capitalism or even subjective forced cultural conformities. Put that on a t-shirt. I don't want to sell it because that <laughs> be but to, no that that is yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Now let's keep going. It becomes as a zone of experiment, a process of improvisation rather than a manufacture of solutions, which is the revolution. During the process of making art seems to suspend the relationship of ours to death. Wow. I'm quoting that, put that out because I, we, right before we started, I said to Quinn, I have no clue about what's next. I'm, here, I'm gonna put it back to the artist, well, here's an artist, uh, and uh, uh, we've just met, but this is brilliant because it captures everything that we have spoken about and, and even articulates in a wonderful and eloquent way what's psychodynamically at stake, which is art as a stepping stone to reality, an arena for the articulation of imaginative worlds, not as psychotic delusions, but as genuine possibilities for future activities. And then I, I love every word of this, but, uh, but I love this distinction uh, between manufacturing of solutions uh, versus the exploration of possibilities. That's where the revolution lies. And uh, a, 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 a big point in the Otto Ronk book about art and artist is when Ronk, who says, I'm not an artist, but, he's, but he wonders about whether or not artists, when they're deeply involved in their respective endeavors, he says, you partake of eternity which is not an amount of time. And that all of the theologians point out uh, that, uh, yeah, we're good capitalists when we talk about eternity as if you can save up hours and then put them in a 401k so they can multiply. Eternity is, is not a quantifiable entity. Rather, it's a phenomenological state of affairs where in Heidegger's words, uh, you get out of inauthentic time, which is just like pieces of white bread, days and hours. And, and uh, you get into the point where, um, as Aldous Huxley put it, uh, in uh, Doors of Perception, uh, when he took hallucinogens for the first time, uh, and he was sitting there for two hours looking at the leg of a table. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, what do you think about time? And he said, oh, there appears to be lots of it. And, and the, the point being that uh, this idea that it, when you're making art, you are momentarily in a different relationship vis-a-vis -vis your own mortality. I, I find that a, a brilliant thought. And it's one that we've been pondering 
uh, how to study empirically, because I think that that that's something that uh, in my egghead world we can hopefully capture. But to me, this would be uh, my own suggested uh, starting point. Uh, and, 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 uh, and again, at the risk of being um, maybe a little glib, but I, I, I think um, my suggestion to artists, which, which again, I think is sometimes easier said than done, is to keep doing what you do, which is being an artist. And sometimes that's hard because I know artists who like eating and uh, it is difficult. It is sometimes if you like eating, uh, easier to again, be more concerned about how you monetize what you do than what you actually do. Yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge concern. We separate these commercial art, personal art, you know, where, where do those lines cross? How, how do you eat if you like yeah, to eat? But how they have to cross eat? because I like eating and, and you know, and we can be silly and we can know, you know, what is Van Gogh sold one painting? He was pretty good. Uh, yeah. But uh, most of us don't have the, the, the patrons that allow us to do that. And I don't know, maybe this is wishful thinking, but even folks that have to essentially um, become commercial entities primarily uh, in order to persist day to day. Um, you know, my hope is to just sneak a little bit of real art and real life <laughs> into what you're doing. Go stealth if, if need be. And that's what I love about this group. This process that most of the folks in this group are watching this, listening to this, whenever or wherever, most of them are working in the wet plate collating process like we've talked about from the mid 18th and 19th century. And the, you can't make a living off of this, right? Wow. I, mean, I mean, maybe you can, but it would be so difficult to do. You can make work. You can make your, you know, like you said, go stealth and sneak some of that away. And that's what I think most folks do here in this particular, there, I, I don't know that there's any quote commercial photographers in in this group that's looking primarily to to commodify making tin types. You know, I mean, there are there are people that open tin type studios and try to make money yeah. and everything, but primarily this group is for artists wanting to express an idea, a concern, love, hate, beauty, whatever whatever we've talked about. But but yeah. you're right, slip away from that. I think the commercialization, the commodification of everything plays such a huge role and then it plays right into the death anxiety and all those concerns. Um, I want to, you, you mentioned Van Gogh. Let me just show, show this real quick. Get your, if you have any questions, we're going to wrap up here in just a second. Um, put those out there. This is Vincent Van Gogh, head of a skeleton with a burning cigarette, 1885, 1886. I love that. Me too. I love it. Yeah. I mean, come on, come on. Um, Definitely, uh, you know, uh, yeah. And anyone who's been to the Van Gogh Museum, I love the way it's arranged because it's the work and the order that he did it. And I defy anybody to tell me that he didn't have a host of existential concerns. <laughs> he, I've been there. I've been there. I've seen those. It's right? beautiful. I love standing on the side of the painting and seeing that relief yes. about three inches, you know? And, yeah. And he, well, and moreover, I just want to point out because the existentialists have always been, uh, the artists have, have been there, you know, just like every step of the way. And uh, what's the fucking guy's name? Uh, Oswald Spangler, a book called The Decline of the West. He pointed out that the art at any given time is a reflection of the prevailing worldviews. Yeah. And so uh, I, I like reading Picasso, for example, talking about his own artwork. And so people, when he first started doing the cubism, 
they'd be like, well, what are you doing? Why, why is everything so distorted? And, and Picasso said, I have no idea what you're talking about in the distortion thing, because what we think we're doing is to show you what something looks like if you view it from all perspectives simultaneously. I can't think of anything more realistic. And, and that will be my other advice to artists. Uh, and uh, that is to uh, take seriously the point that I made earlier without arrogance. And that is you are the avatars of the future. Uh, art is a stepping stone to reality. It is uh, the way that we articulate imaginative worlds. It, yeah, and so don't be bashful about taking a stab at where you think we ought be heading uh, when folks uh, ask you about your art or when you have an opportunity uh, to explain what you think you're up to when you get to show your work. I, I, I have become, as, I, as I, I'm on the threshold of senility, I never paid attention when I went to galleries or museums to the artist's statements because generally I didn't find them all that useful, but that's to my discredit. I, I find them now to be really critical, even though I still wait till after I've seen an exhibit because I want to get my impression first and then I'll go look at it again when I realize that the artist had a completely different idea. Yeah, good, good points. I, I love hearing you say that because I am such an advocate of context and intention. Yes. And you can bring your own life filters to somebody's work, but that's not the artist's intention of the work, right? That's right. So so there's you know, there's a couple of different worlds we can live in. Let me pull some of these up here, Sheldon. This is Linda, she's in Sweden. Um, listen to that. It's been so interesting to learn to talk about this denial of death. I feel it's changed my view of things in life. I tried to talk to my friends about it, but they shut down as soon as death comes. Um, how do I get them to understand that this open up your life, this to get them to open up and your life more or to open up to your life? Wow. Well, Linda, thank you. Um, I do not know except to say that the, the point, and it, I have to say this to remind myself is that we're, it's not about death. It's ultimately uh, about life. And, and it's easy to, to get preoccupied with the death end um, where it can become debilitating. Uh, and so um, uh, we, uh, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Sherwood Anderson. Um, and he, on his tombstone, his epitaph it is life, not death is the great adventure. Now, of course, the irony is he's dead, but, 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 uh, the the point that a lot of folks make is that the whole idea about having a mature confrontation with one's mortality uh, is is that you it, that it ultimately serves to enrich life. So I like how Rollo May put it, where he's like, "Look, if you're sitting in a closet, you know, watching Ingemar Bergman films and uh, are no longer care to go outside, uh, well, uh, th th that that's unfortunate because y you'll know if your confrontation with mortality has been successful if it ultimately propels you back into your community uh, enriched and encouraged. And so I guess that is my point when I try and engage folks about these matters. It's, it's not about death. It, it's about life. Uh, and I hope that that's a start. Yeah. And, and even in your, the, the sub line of your book, your warm at the court, isn't it uh, the role of death in life kind of thing? Yeah, yeah that's right. So yeah. uh, and it's easy to get caught midway. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, Christopher Barrett just said, we going back a little bit. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the pursuits of tin types and profits are inversely proportional, meaning that you're not really going to, you know, you're going to make work uh, for personal and, and 
you know, emotional, spiritual, whatever reasons you have. Um, yes. And then Chopper's back. Um, I find it interesting how capitalism practices were not attacked before the industrial age, but after became a target. Was this because of the rapid change of then, the then potential ease of living? Hmm. We're not attacked before the industrial age. Yeah, uh, actually, Chopper, great question. I'm tempted to make something up, but I would rather. <laughs> uh, no, 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 this is uh, uh, what some people argue is that when things became problematic is when uh, most finance no longer had anything to do with producing something tangible. Yes. That, that's my understanding. And that's what Hannah Arendt says in her book about fascism it is once most money is made by trafficking and abstractions that never even remotely intersect uh, with the production of goods and services, that that's when it became a, a really remarkably effective way of siphoning off the energy and resources of earth to a shockingly yeah. tiny number of people. Yeah, I cut. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is from April a bit back. The pandemic has shown not only the vulnerability of human nature, but also the animalistic behavior as well. Very good point, April. What, when I read this, what came to my mind was um, they just had to pass a law about Asian um, uh, racial, you know, problems, uh, Americans, or maybe, I don't know if it's, it's, it's in America for sure. I don't know if it's global or not, but they here in America, they just had to pass a law saying, don't do that. You know, like it's so explicit that Asians in this country are getting attacked and, and molested and, and, you know, those kinds of things because of the pandemic, because of the flu uh, the 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 pan, uh coronavirus and they're they're blaming it on you know trying to that kind of thing and like you said we're so ignorant and racist we don't even know people from different parts of the world you know we can't even tell them uh, uh yeah. part of them. now in fairness to americans that there's a, a a literature on pandemics and unfortunately they always bring out the worst in us and it, and it is easier to try and understand something by blaming something tangible. You can't see a virus, but you could see the people that look different. Uh, and so unfortunately, conspiracy theories uh, and believing um, fascists, dictators, uh, is common uh, to lots of pandemics. But of course, we're at the high end uh, of uh, inhumanity. Uh, in that regard. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Pablo in Argentina, he's a good friend. He's always in here. He came late. I'll have to see the whole. He says, yeah. hi, I'm Pablo. Say hi to Sheldon and all. So there you go. We got to sh shout out our, our brothers and sisters. Well, hey, no, Mark, thank yeah, you. Bring up a, Mark, Mark's a big fan of yours like me uh, and these ideas and theories and stuff. And, and he did his, uh, he just presented a week or two ago. I'll have artists come on in the community and present their work and he just did his uh, graduate degree a few years ago and he brought on and, and showed his work and, 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 and talked about you and talked about Becker and things like that. So you are in the art community to some degree. It's just, I hope we, your ideas, not you personally, but the ideas and uh, Becker and, and what your work has done. That's what I'm trying to do. And I think there's other people in the community that would like to bring these up a little more on the surface for artists whatever medium you're working in to, to integrate and to think about at least, I know there are no answers. That's, that's the, one of the things about it, right? It's the journey, so to speak, but I think we can make, uh, make the, the world a little bit better if we do, you know, engage with one another and make this stuff kind of tangible. Yeah. And to, again, at the risk of sounding naive, but to go back to this guy, Henry Miller, who I like from a century ago, uh, and again, here's the guy who says art, is a stepping stone to reality. In, in, in the very same essay, uh, he says two other things that I, I think are important. One is he quotes this uh, dead Indian dude, Krishna Murte, who says, everyone wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. So why don't we start by looking in the mirror? And I always thought that that was, that was good. Right? But, but then he said, look, uh, there's a lot of people 
in the world today. Now he's writing in the 1950s, but he's just as right now. There's a lot of awesome people in the world with noble intentions. And the reality is, is that almost none of us are gonna be the next Jesus or Gandhi or Einstein or Mother Teresa or, or Angela Merkel or fill in the blank, just people that, um, uh, you know, Maya Angelou, just folks that we love and admire who are world changers. But Miller's point is it's not for us to judge who's gonna change the world. It, when Van Gogh died, who would have known that that was a, a game changer? Uh, Thoreau evidently sold less than 100 copies of Walden. Nietzsche, uh, he just said, nobody reads my books. And, and so uh, uh, Miller's point is, it doesn't matter if you're an artist or a chemist or a politician, you may at the end of your life be like, fuck, I didn't do anything. Well, you know what? You don't, you don't know that. Who knows if a hundred years after you expire, somebody discovers your work and it transforms the world. Moreover, who knows? Uh, you guys uh, are artists. Uh, you, you make a photograph and you're doing some kind of presentation uh, where there's a kid in fifth grade who sees your picture and says, wow, I'm going to do that. Well, maybe that's the next Gandhi or Barack Obama or, or fill in the blank. And, and I, I, I like how Thoreau, I think in Walden, he has this metaphor, like you throw a pebble in the pond and then you have these rippling effects. Yeah. Well, let's all ripple on. It's not for us to judge. Hey, that's a t-shirt, Sheldon. That's Rip right. Along. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this because, because it's it's not. It, it is the, the fact of the matter is, it, is it's, and I, I say this to remind myself, it, it's ultimately uh, arrogantly egocentric to demand that there be a tangible effect of our uh, pursuits here on earth. Good point. Uh, uh, let, let's just, uh, uh, you know, not to go Star Trek, but let's boldly go forth uh, uh, where uh, we have uh, not yet dared to trod uh, and, uh, and let's do so, uh, you know, with an open mind and a kind heart uh, and let us have the, the faith. Uh, uh, not, not, it, it need not be faith in God, which I'm not knocking, but can't we all have faith in life? Uh, and uh, I believe that to be um, a, a way to proceed that is all things being equal better than any existing alternative. I totally agree. Well said. We, we will let you go. We'll close this up. We got a little bit over, but man, I, I know I speak for everyone in this room and everyone watching on YouTube and everyone that will watch us in the future. We thank you for your time, Sheldon. I know we know you're busy. We appreciate what you've done. And in 100 years, people will be, if we last that long, we'll be definitely reading your, your works. And you, you do have your, you should rest comfortably. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm very comfortable. But uh, more important, thank you for doing this, Quinn. Absolutely. Thanks to all the folks uh, that were listening uh, you guys know how to use computers. Uh, uh, you can find me uh, on the email. Um, I am busy sitting here where I've been for two years and where I'll be for the next 10. <laughs> you know how to find me. I'm happy to come back. We'd uh, love uh, to have you come back. Sure. Uh, and, uh, love to have so, you. Uh, let's see this as the first opportunity to engage in an ongoing dialogue that can only be made better by getting together as embodied entities at some vaguely unspecified future moment. Let, let's, uh, there'd be nothing better than to have had this exchange in the same room. And I know that that couldn't have ha happened otherwise. And maybe there's some good things about these mediums. I know that there is, 
this is still a pale shadow of a direct interaction with an embodied human. And let's have one of those someday. So thank you Amen. very much. This was awesome. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you for everything you've done. We will have you back on. Thank you for everybody in the room. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everything, but we've kept them long enough. And we'll have you back, Sheldon. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Have a good one. Thank you, brother. Bye. Ciao. Thanks, guys. That was wonderful. I, I love